please state your name and how long you've been a professional wrestler. Sure. My name is Tim Dons. I've been wrestling for the better part of 15 years. That's a tough question. I would say Tim Donst is a underdog. He always has his back towards the wall, uh, trying to fight forward. I'd definitely say he's a tough individual, um, fighting spirit, uh, big heart, never die attitude. So I think Tim Donst uh, is a way stronger, uh, over-the-top version of myself, a more confident version of myself. Um, in my day-to-day -day life, I'm a lot more shy, a lot more humble, um, a lot more laid back, not attention-seeking whatsoever, but there really is a change uh, in my eyes. And when I step through that current, I become Tim Dons. I feel invincible and I feel like I can do anything. How important do you think characters are in professional wrestling? I think characters are extremely important to professional wrestling. It's the same as any medium, um, whether it's comic books, television, movies, uh, characters that you both relate to or have empathy towards completely drive how strong of a narrative it has. So um, in a story-driven industry like professional wrestling, it's extremely uh, important to have. So I think originally I got inspiration from the movie The Wrestler with uh, Mickey Rourke, because he's like this down-on-his-luck wrestler, and that's not a version of wrestling you see often. Usually pro wrestling is glamorized, where you get to see, oh, how much money they make, and they get to all this traveling, but you don't get to see. We miss funerals and weddings and nights out with our friends, and a lot of people end up driving hours wrestling for 20 minutes, then driving hours back, only to work their nine to five the next day. It's a very exhausting industry. And in relation to superheroes, I always compared it very much to um, when Spider-Man's written properly, kids want to grow up to become Spider-Man. He's fun, he's flying around through the uh, building, swinging, whatnot. Uh, when Batman's written properly, uh, he's a very engaging character, but like you don't want to be Batman. He's essentially a sociopath. He's someone that doesn't trust anybody. He's someone that de dedicates his life to a never-ending quest where he has to have a backup plan after backup plan after backup plan. So I always really liked the idea of bringing that realism back to professional wrestling with some of my darker Tim Dons promos, where people were like, oh, maybe being a professional wrestler isn't as easy as I thought it would be, or uh, maybe I shouldn't put it on the pedestal, and hopefully uh, it makes people respect it a lot more. Watching wrestling and growing up, who was that for you? Who was the character where you latched onto and said, oh, this resonates with me? I would say Mick Foley, uh, Cactus Jack, just the fact that he was able to mutilate his body in such a creative fashion, while again, like not giving up. Like this guy should have stayed down a plethora of times, but he kept fighting, kept uh, uh, standing up for himself. And I always looked up to the fact that here's this guy that never says die. So one of the fun things about pro wrestling is you're kind of your own producer and director. So, no one's really stopping me from trying whatever I want to do. And you know what's working, what's not working based on the crowd reaction, because professional wrestling is an interactive Broadway show. So if you're getting a good reaction, regardless of what you're doing in that ring, as far as I'm concerned, then uh, you're doing your job. Sweet. As long as you can hear me. Sir. So. Uh, could you please to the camera state your name and how long you've been a professional wrestler? My name is Avery Good, professional wrestler, and I'm real close to 17 years in this wonderful world of pro wrestling. Avery Good, like, I think there's a famous quote, I don't know exactly it word for word, but they're like, you know, the Undertaker said, like, your personality should be you cranked up to 11. And, and Avery Good is that personality, kind of, not that I had at the beginning of wrestling, but the attitude that I feel like I've earned. Um, you know, I, I, I 
dubbed myself a workhorse in pro wrestling because I've seen myself outwork many, right? Not all, there's, there's guys who've outworked me for sure, but I know the effort that I put in to become a very good professional wrestler, both in the ring, out of the ring, in the gym, in my promos, like every aspect of pro wrestling I've worked at to become as good as I possibly could. So Avery Good is that, right? It's me letting the world know that I want to be known as a very good professional wrestler. From my opinion, characters are everything in professional wrestling, and I know sometimes we live in a world where everybody just wants to be this character that's a cool version of themselves, which I currently am, uh, which is okay in my mind too. Um, but, you know, I grew up on early 90s, late 80s WWF, right, which was like the world of characters. You know, I grew up on your, your Joint the Clowns and your Crushes and your Hakushis and everybody was a different character, Mr. Fuji's, Bobby Heenan's, right, all of these personalities. That's what sucked me in, right? If I was a little kid and all wrestling was was like two, two super athletic dudes in there like having the greatest athletic matchup ever, like it probably would have sucked me in as a little kid um, the way characters had done. As a grown up, like yeah, I can appreciate two guys going in there in the best shape of their life and giving me this spectacle of athleticism. But as a little kid, like when I got sucked in, it was straight characters. And then fast forward even to the mid late 90s, uh, what sucked me back into wrestling as, as a teen who had kind of grown away a little bit was ECW. And uh, ECW, I think, is notorious for like, hey, go back and watch it, and it's not as good as it was. Um, and I think that's wrong. Like, sure, the wrestling maybe isn't up, um, up to par with wrestling of nowadays as far as athleticism and things like that. But a lot of it was just guys rumbling around a building, hitting each other with stuff. But the character work was amazing, right? Uh, uh, more real life, like in your face characters, your Ravens, your Tommy Dreamers, um, Cactus Jack while he was there, your, even your Mikey Whitrex. Like a fan can sympathize and appreciate and and feel the pain that that guy's going through because in one way or another we've all been there. Um, so it's a different type of character, but at the same time, like, character's always, always what attracted me to professional wrestling. So it's funny, so I would say Foley's a very interesting example because he had so many different versions of his character, whether it's the Dude Love or the Cactus or Mankind. He had a bunch of different facets that appealed to different people, but overall I would say one of the most underrated characters of all time is forever going to be Raven because he was this a loner wrestler who you could put in any situation and you'd be able to determine what he'd probably do or how he would react. And he, he never, in an ECW that was filled with all these hardcore tough guys, he somehow managed to be roped into that group without ever really whooping ass most of the time. Like, for being a guy that's at the top of his career, he really did get beat up a majority of his matches only to end up on top. But yeah, it's such an engaging character in my career, right? Growing up in the world of Chikara, I had a lot of silly or goofy gimmicks, and then later on in the world of Dasher Hatfield, I kind of grew old of that, and I wanted to just, you know, finally be recognized not as a comedy guy or a gimmick guy, but a guy who can go in there and put on the best pro wrestling matches you've ever seen. Um, and I felt like as Dasher Hatfield, I was definitely doing that, but still, at the same time, like, wasn't getting the credit for that. I was only, ah, oh, you're the silly guy, or you're the funny guy, right? In, in my own little Chikara bubble, sure, like, I had that recognition. Um, but outside of that, it was always, I felt like, just like, ah, you do the funny spots, you play the baseball games. So I think Avery Good was born from, from all of that kind of bitterness and resentment of people just saying like, hey, this guy is underrated. If the world's not going to call me very good, then I'll call myself very good because I know I've earned that title. This one here for me represents the beginning, right? This is the first mask that I got that I loved. I wouldn't say it's the first one I got, but the first ones I got were kind of generic. Um, and then I got one that kind of looked like this, but it had a little red on it. But this was the first one that I loved. It became me, the blue I wanted. Um, and it was a gift from a mask maker in Japan, which made it a little more special to me too. But this was the first one that when I got it, I knew, didn't know why, but knew this one was special. It was with me for some of my best matches, um, some of my most important matches. But this is definitely one that's gonna hang on the wall for a long, 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 long time. So, no matter what form of media I watch, whether it's television or movies, Whatever can emotionally grab you the strongest, I think, is always the thing that compels me to watch those the most. And so with professional wrestling, kind of just like a magician, when you go to, to go see a magic show, you know this guy really isn't levitating. You know this guy really isn't uh, making an elephant disappear on stage. But there's certain moments when you go see a really successful magician where you're like, I know magic's fake, but I'm not sure if that was fake. And I think when pro wrestling is done in its most proper form, and the easiest way to do that is like, grounded, like you mentioned, uh, that's what happens. Like there's moments where I'll watch myself back on tape and I'm like, I'm not faking that. Like 
I really wanted to punch that guy in the face. Those landing on those thumbtacks really hurt. And you have these like little beautiful moments where there really is no distinction between uh, fake and reality. Um, good is just relatable. Like, can people relate to it? Is it something that when they see, they can connect to that character some way? And that connection could be, you know, in their own mind, negative or positive. Something they can relate to and, and feel for. Is it some kind of sympathy that they can reach out to and, and, and supply support during a wrestling show? Or is it a character they hate for some reason? Reminds them of, them of their boss or their ex-wife or somebody in their life that hate, they hate? Like, good characters to me are relatable. Um, iconic characters are, I guess they're just the best at doing that, right? Like, the icon when it comes to characters is always always the Undertaker. Um, I've never been a huge Undertaker guy, but give respect where it's due, like, that guy was the best wrestling character of all time. Um, to me, sometimes it's even putting your guard down. Like, my favorite wrestler of all time is a guy named Kurt Angle, and right? I think we all know Kurt Angle. Maybe not. Maybe you don't know Kurt Angle, but... Kurt Angle, to me, is the greatest wrestler of all time. One, because he's an Olympic gold medal champion, right? That means he's a great, great wrestler. Um, but Kurt Angle, when he came into pro wrestling, he was able to put that, that ego aside, the ego that he earned of being an Olympic gold medal, an Olympic gold medal, which he won with a broken freaking neck, right? And he was able to go out there and be the butt of a joke, right? So that an audience can laugh at him and relate in that way. He was able to go out there and be the most believable, badass human being you've ever seen, right? From either end of the spectrum, like this chicken shit heel who's running away, you know, getting sprayed by milk and making an embarrassment out of himself all the way to like the scariest dude you've ever, ever seen ever and you'd never want to step inside a ring with. Um, to me, that's character work from one end of the spectrum to the other. And I don't think anybody's ever done it more than him or not more than him, but better than him. So it's funny, you can go two ways. I would say on one end you have, you know, uh, Daniel Bryan, Bryan Danielson, who's a very grounded, uh, hold for hold technical wrestler. And then you also have people like uh, Necro Butcher, Dean Ambrose, John Moxley, who does crazy hardcore weapon associated stuff. And then even one little tier past that, I, I once wrestled uh, someone named Moscow, who was a uh, Russian cow. So it was a person in a cow outfit. And uh, whenever he would do the Ric Flair chop, everyone would chant, moo, of course. I started, like, again, back to my love of ECW. Like, I loved how ECW was a place that was just a family of guys building something special from, from the ground up. And when I discovered Chikara, like, I was like, that's that thing. That's that this generation's ECW where it's going to be different. It's going to be different than every other wrestling you're, you're watching right now. And it's going to change the landscape of pro wrestling. And I wanted to be a part of that more than anything. Um, so I began to train with Mike Quackenbush, Claudio Castagnoli, and Chris Hero down at the ECW arena of all places. And I wasn't an original trainee there, but I kept showing up and I kept showing up. But eventually, Mike Quack Quackenbush came up to me and he's like, I got an idea for you. Honestly, I didn't care what it was. Like, I was going to do it. I was so excited to be a, an official part of that roster and that family. Um, and the idea was create a wrestler. So this was like, I would come out for a couple months and be this generic kind of wrestler. Basic moves, basic gear, plain mask. And uh, eventually, the fans would enter in ideas where they got to create a wrestler just like in a video game. They could pick his moves, they could pinch, pick his entrance song, they could pick everything for him. And that was the whole gimmick they pitched me. Um, I, I even kind of love the idea because as a wrestling fan, like I created myself in a video game, who hadn't? And uh, so I, we did that for a couple months and the first idea was a giant cow costume that kind of broke my heart a little bit. Um, I'll never forget pulling up to that building the first day and a wrestler named Akuma was out there. Maybe you're familiar with Akuma, great pro wrestler. Um, and he goes, hey, have you seen your gear yet? Because they told me not to buy gear. They told me they had it for me. And I was picturing this like awesome cow gear with a Russian singlet because his name was Moscow. He's a Russian bovine. And I was like, no, I haven't seen it yet. And he starts laughing. And Akuma has this very famous laugh in our neck of the woods where he just kind of shakes like this and smiles. It's kind of evil. He's an evil looking, chucky looking dude in general. And uh, I, was, I knew I was in trouble right then. And when I had got in there and I saw the gear, it wasn't wrestling gear. It was a big cow costume, much like Chick-fil-A or Barney the Dinosaur with a big giant head. And all my dreams of doing all the cool moves in pro wrestling just flew right out of the window, right? But in hindsight, like being forced to do something I didn't want to do and get myself out of my comfort zone was super helpful. Like I remember making my first entrance and I didn't know what a big giant Russian cow would do. Um, and so like I even did like, I think like a silly dance or something. And I was like, I, in my brain, I was like, I know this isn't it. And I get in the ring and I sit there and I take a deep breath and I'm just like, stop overthinking this. Like, be the damn cow. What would a giant Russian cow do? And I'm like, you know what a giant Russian cow would do? Nothing. He'd cross his arms like this. 
and he looked like he's the most badass dude ever in the history of the world, like Ivan Drago, and in that moment I found, like for me, what that character was, and I taught myself what it was to not be yourself, and to be a character, and to think like a character. Um, so for me, that was a big shift in my understanding of how to become something I'm not, so that I could succeed in the world of pro wrestling. Um, with this gimmick though, in Chikara we ran in seasons, so at the beginning of season two, back to create a wrestler. Thank God, right? I didn't want to be that cow anymore. Um, but back to season two, create a wrestler for a couple months, enter idea number two, which was Ultimo Breakfast, which now was a breakfast superhero Spartan thing of some sort. I'm still not really quite sure. Um, people seem to enjoy it. Again, I hated it, right? Like wrestling, back to the Undertaker quote, is supposed to be me kind of extended, and I was, never had dreams of being a breakfast Spartan. Um, the gear was cool, right? We got to come up with breakfasty puns. It was fun. Um, people would ask me near the end, they're like, are you going to keep doing this? And I'm like, no, no, I'm not going to keep doing this. It was short-lived. Um, people seemed to enjoy it. And this time I actually got to wrestle, so I got to work on that aspect of my pro wrestling. Third time through, create a wrestler again. That's when we landed on Dasher Hatfield. Now me, I'm a huge sports guy. So right away I was like, yeah, this one's for me. This is the one that I'm going to keep, hopefully. And from day one, like through the curtain, out of the gate, the fans loved it. You could tell I was having fun, like I wasn't doing something I was kind of forced into. Um, I'd worked my way a little bit up the ladder, right, to finally get to do something I wanted to do. Um, fans loved it. I loved it. It was so much fun for a really, really long time. And Dasher Hatfield was just an old-timey king of swing. That was his name, man. He was an old-timey baseball player. He went out. He made the people laugh. He did the baseball slides. But, man, he could, he could wrestle. So I definitely learned throughout the whole process, right? Like with Moscow, I really couldn't build matches and do much in a match. I really just had to stick to like, what would a big cow do? So that, like I said, that enhanced my character development, like rapid speed. Like it was just put in hyperdrive and like, oh, I was learning fast because that's all I had to go by. I couldn't hear, I couldn't do here's my cool move to get over, right? I had to literally just be, get people to understand this character and that was my only choice. Um, the breakfast thing, I, th I would say, yeah, that was just fun. Um, other than like actually getting to structure matches and learning how to put matches together and being able to wrestle around a little bit with, at the time, what little bit of wrestling ability I had. Um, but I mean, Dasher stuck around, so I learned so much as Dasher. That's really, I, I evolved into myself. I learned um, how to have fun with professional wrestling to, you know, to get what I was doing and what I was enjoying to translate to fans so they enjoyed it as well. Um, a lot of that came through Dasher, and Dasher really what made me into the wrestler I am today, right? That gave me the platform to wrestle in front of some of the greatest fans, have some of the best opponents in the world. I wrestled guys like Tommaso Ciampa, Claudio Castagnoli, Hollow Wicked, Orange Cassidy, all under that banner of Dasher Hadfield. Um, but I don't know, just grateful for that experience, uh, grateful for all, for all of it, even though I'm kind of like, some of it wasn't my favorite. Like I said, it definitely evolved me into the wrestler that I, that I became. Um, and it kind of helped me evolve into Avery Good. Like I get to look back and say, like, look at all the bullshit that I had to do to finally, all these years later, get to do what I want to do, which is just do me. This one represents the end, right? So when I was winding down my career as Dasher Hadfield, I had two masks made. I had this one made and one that was black and gold um, from, my, from my heel Dasher Hadfield run, which was something I was never really interested in doing. I never wanted to be a bad guy with the mask, but I did it anyways. Um, so this one just, yeah, it kind of represents the end for me, and it's shiny and gold, and it kind of also represents like the evolution, right? Going from just like normal colored pro wrestler, kind of okay, to like a very good professional wrestler with all the gold and the, the sparkles and everything, the glitz and the glamour that goes along with it. Uh, so there's definitely a little evolution in, in the masks as well as there's an evolution in the wrestler. Unfortunately, you had a very real blending of your character and yourself announcing your retirement in the ring at, at time. Uh, do you think that changed how you present yourself in wrestling? Like, is it more you human being than it used to be, or do you still present yourself mostly as how Tim Dost has always been presented? It's funny. I think it definitely made me appreciate not only life, but obviously professional wrestling a lot more, because I know more than a lot of my peers that it can be taken away from me at any moment. Um, if anything, it honestly probably propelled me even more to do more dangerous maneuvers or use more dangerous objects in my matches uh, because of the fact that now I can appreciate 
the light at the end of the tunnel, if you will. Because when I originally got the diagnosis, I was told I was going to die. That was so being told that you're going to die and never wrestle again, to five years later still being able to do what you're doing, is certainly a blessing. So I might as well use my body while I can. There's a lot of different dynamics I think you can pull out when talking about the realism, dark sides of professional wrestling. I mean, don't get me wrong, I love this sport. It's given me so much. I have to travel so much, meet so many cool people. But again, people don't really realize what it does to you uh, mentally and emotionally at times, politicking, backstabbing, all this crazy stuff. Um, so that's definitely something I'd like to uh, explore more down the road. I, there's a time in my life I was borderline homeless. I was like living in a uh, electricity list, a 10 foot trailer, and um, just not having any money to your name and still struggling is something that I like having that feeling of always being hungry. My favorite piece of advice I got when it comes to character work, it kind of just and relates to in wrestling in general, is just to do something to get better every day, right? And then that can be something for your character. That can be standing in a mirror and practicing promos. That could be watching movies or films or other wrestlers that you think somehow can relate, that you could maybe creatively borrow some ideas from, um, things like that. It's just constantly putting work in and getting better. Like I said, and that's character work, that's in-ring work, that's being a good human being. Like, make yourself a better person every single day in whatever it is your goal may be. Likewise, what's your go-to advice if somebody comes up to you in the locker room? Um, my go-to advice, um, and I feel like I've been asked this a lot now, right, since I'm on my way out, but I think people are taking this last chance to be like, hey, like, help me out, I may never see you again, which is a very true possibility. Um, but my go-to advice is always never look, look a gift horse in the mouth, right? And I kind of did that with the cow thing, like I was looking for what this cow was, when in reality, like, I know what a cow is, like, I know what like a badass Russian dude is, like, why am I trying to recreate this when I already know what these things are, just pretend to be that. Um, and I relate this a lot to wrestling matches. For example, like if you and I were going to wrestle today, what makes our match special than everything else? Not, hey, what are your moves and then let's combine it with what are my moves. No, like let's not tell two different stories at the same time. Let's figure out how what we have character-wise, wrestling-wise, personality-wise, let's figure out how these characters would mesh together. And to me that makes all of it so much more simple, right? Like I would react differently as a very good professional wrestler if I was wrestling, um, let's say, you know, a group of ants, for example. Right? I would have a different strategy going into that if we were pretending this was a real battle than I would if I was going in and I was wrestling um, the world's strongest man. Right? Like I wouldn't look at those situations the same. So why would I come in and say like, oh, here's my moves I do. No, like that's dumb as could be. Um, so try to look at the, the situation as real as you can. Like you treat it like real life and think, all right, these are the gifts we've been given with these characters and personalities and talents that we have. Um, and after that for me, everything kind of just writes itself. Uh, Brian Kendrick Spanky once told me be different, which is kind of what led me down that uh, Mickey Wark road, um, as well as some of my previous life experiences, unfortunately. But uh, one of my favorite pieces of his advice was uh, Josh Prohibition, who's a really amazing dude, and he once told me uh, pressure is a privilege. So I like to keep that in the back of my mind in case I'm about to main event a show or, or do something that I feel a little uneasy about. Uh, remembering that pressure is a privilege and anybody should be lucky to have that kind of weight on their shoulders really changes your perspective and always gets me fired up and uh, ready to go out there and kill it. In the same thing, if somebody comes up and asks you for advice, what's your like, go-to? In uh, life or professional wrestling? I don't know what Got you. Uh, in life, I would say, um, if you have something nice to say, say it. A lot of people say, you know, if you have something mean to say, don't say anything at all, but if you have something nice to say, you should say it. Whether it's complimenting someone's shirt or their personality or whatever the case may be, it just makes the world a whole lot better place. Uh, professional wrestling wise, I would say um, uh, you don't necessarily need a script. And if you go out there and do your job, uh, you can feel whether or not you're, you're doing it right or not. And have you learned anything from being a good? Yeah, have fun, right? And sometimes have fun isn't the normal definition for fun. Sometimes having fun is like entertaining yourself. Um, and in pro wrestling, we sacrifice our time, we sacrifice our bodies, right, our health. So if you're not out there like popping numero uno, which is yourself, I feel like you're doing something wrong. And for a long time, right, like yeah, it's our job to entertain the fans. But for a long time, like I would stress out over like what can I do to, uh, to please everybody involved, whether that be fans, whether it be my superiors, guys who've been around longer than me, my trainers. Um, I think it took me a little bit too long to realize like, 
if I go in there and I just enjoy myself and I have a great time and I do what I want to do, um, that translates, right? And people can relate to that. Uh, and in that, in that case, people will invest more in me. Um, but that's what I've learned being Avery Good, just because over the last two years or so since I've been Avery Good, despite the broken leg, um, I've had so much fun. It's been so enjoyable and it translates for me. Like when I watch everything back, it just, I just look more natural. I just look like I'm enjoying myself. I look more believable. Um, I look more in the moment. All of that stuff comes to play when you're just like, hey, have fun. Enjoy this wild ride that is pro wrestling. So wrestling definitely brings you a brotherhood of people. It makes you friends with people you otherwise would have never interacted with. I've always uh, really respected and loved that. It brought me a lot of confidence. You know, that ring is really truly when I feel invincible and I feel like myself. It's the only time that uh, I'm not worried about uh, girls or bills or work or anything else. Like there's this small fraction of time in my life where uh, I feel like I can do anything and that's when I'm stepping foot into a ring. I didn't have to be, pretend to be something else, right? And I didn't mind doing that with Dasher Hatfield because I love that character, I love that idea. Um, but Avery Good, like I really don't know what it's gonna be from one day to the next because ah, what kind of mood am I in today? Like do I wanna go out and play around or am I grumpy today and I just wanna fight somebody today? Um, it's, it's really not a character so much as to just me, again, entertaining myself. Um, and I'm at a point in my wrestling career where I'm okay with that. And if people don't like what I'm doing, I'm okay with that too. Like, I'm not out there like searching for every single booking I can get my hands on nowadays. Like, I'm not out there trying to impress every single promoter that may have come and watched my match. Like, I'm out there to entertain myself and just do what I want to do. Like, selfishly, yeah, but I feel like I've kind of earned that right. So then would you say that at this point, every good is you doing what you wanted to do? Um, not this whole time, but for a long time. Like there, there came a point in Dasher Hatfield where I was, kind of got complacent and it got easy. Um, and I'm definitely somebody who, who likes to rise to the challenge. And when it wasn't challenging anymore, I found myself just kind of being repetitive. And that's when I was just like, I've got to do something else. Like this is great, but I feel like I've, I've taken it as far as it's going to go. You know, I've been this uber happy baby face character for a long, 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 long time. And although like I, I was getting, I think, more recognition with my in work finally a little bit, I was just kind of over being that type of character and just kind of over being something that wasn't me um, and so I wanted that challenge and at, at that point in my career maybe 11 12 years in I'd been babyface forever and I was like hey I want that challenge of, of being a heel and I kind of had a reputation of like being a nice guy which which I'll still say I am I'm a pretty nice guy like I'm trustworthy I don't bullshit you if I tell you I do something I'll do it um, but inside the wrestling ring like I wanted that opportunity to prove to the world and especially people who told me I don't think you could do that right I had a couple people tell me that I wanted that opportunity to prove to the world not only can I be a heel but I'll be a hell of a heel while I'm at it. Now that you're going to get ready to retire, are there parts you still wish you could have gotten the chance to explore that you didn't and if so was it because you were half-filled for so long or was being unmasked right before the pandemic did that play a part into maybe not necessarily getting all of what you wanted out of the favorite? Yeah, I think you, you hit the nail on the head with a lot of those questions. Like, I think I, I overstayed my welcome as Dasher Hatfield um, a, li a little bit. Um, and then pandemic definitely slowed it down because as soon as I started just kind of rolling around doing my own thing, I was definitely picking up bookings. I was getting some of those matches that I really always wanted, which was against the best wrestlers in the world, right? Not the best comedy wrestlers, no offense comedy wrestlers, but I wanted to step in the ring now and prove athletically I've worked my way up to just be, I'll be one of those cool guys who's real athletic and kind of have those banger matches. Right, that was something on, on my list that I wanted to check off, and I was starting to get those. I won the Super 8, which is a big deal to me. Um, pen, between pandemic and breaking my leg, that, that put a big halt on it. Um, and as soon as we came working out of that, I picked up right where I left off. Um, but for me, then, it, real, real life kicked in, which, which was something I always promised myself a long time ago, which was when I, when I hit a point where I know like wrestling is only ever gonna be fun for me, right? A good time, not a career, or not you know, moving on to bigger and better things. Like, as a dad with two kids who I love very much, right? Like, it's time for me to then step away. Like, uh, and, and that's what I'm doing. It's something I promised myself. Um, my wife is the greatest. Like, that's like something she never put on me. She's even like now as we're getting close, she's like, are you sure, are you sure? Because she, know, she knows I'm gonna go a little crazy, I think, without, you know, being a professional wrestler, without knowing that I get to be this special person on the weekends. Um, but in my, in my life, that's what I need to do. Um, and is it going to be sad? Yeah, but do I think I'm making a mistake? No. So like to answer your question again though as far as like oh, am I going to miss out on Yeah, I think I'm wrestling my best matches I've ever wrestled right now. Um, so to call it quits at that point, like I'm going to feel like there's definitely something left on the table because there is, right? But unfortunately, for, I guess fortunately for me, I don't want to say unfortunately, but I've got two different tables. 
right? I've got this great family life table over here and I've got this pro wrestler table over here and they're both filled with great things. And I'm at a point where I can only pick one, right? I can't split my attention any longer. Um, and as much as it's sad for me, it's time to just stop being selfish. And, you know, I wouldn't say I've, I've been a selfish dad, but it's time to just give my kids and my family like 100% dad. Um, lastly, this one to me represents the future, right? Like I'm real eager and excited to watch the future of professional wrestling. I've got a lot of friends who are younger guys and girls in their 20s who are still going to be pro wrestler. This one was Boomer Hatfield's mask. This is when I beat him and I took his mask off of him, releasing him out into the world, right? You're free, little birdie, fly away. But him, much like a lot of other people on Independence, they bust their butt, and I hope they get everything they dreamed of out of this world of pro wrestling, just like I did. What does professional wrestling mean to you? Um, professional wrestling means a lot to me. Um, I can start with work ethic. Like when I started as a professional wrestler, I just recently failed out of college, and I was probably one of the most lazy human beings. Uh, on the face of this, uh, this earth and professional wrestling taught me to set goals. It taught me if I want something, I just work at it. And if I work at it long enough, I'll get what I want. Um, so that's first and foremost and that's translated into every aspect of my life. Um, most importantly, being a dad. Like, being a dad's the most important thing to me and so like, I don't ever shortchange my kids. I come home and I'm tired and they want to play, I get up and I play, right? And so professional wrestling kind of taught me that. Um, to, to not focus on the obligations, but to focus on the opportunities that come if you fulfill your obligations. Um, Outside of that, professional wrestling means to me like it made me special for a long, 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 long time. And with the end coming near, that's my biggest worry is just feeling like, hey, what do I do when I don't feel like I get to be a pro wrestler anymore, right? Pro wrestlers made me feel kind of above the normal crowd, above the normal person for a long time. And now I'm just going to be, you know, another face in the crowd. What does professional wrestling mean to you? Uh, professional wrestling means the world to me. I think when it's done properly, it's the most engaging form of entertainment on this planet. It's real life comic book characters, it's good versus evil. It engulfs in the history of humanity. If you look at it from the 70s, 80s, 90s, whatever's going on politically, gets roped into whatever goes on in that ring. And um, I can uh, totally see why it's continuing to thrive for a hundred and a half years. Is there anything else that you'd like to say? No, uh, thank you for making this documentary and I appreciate you having me on. Thank you very much.